Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma bara habita fi Allah as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh hayyakum Allah Continuing on in our study of al-usul al-sitta we were last speaking about the fourth asl min usul al-sitta the fourth foundation and we left off uh, speaking about this foundation, the statements of Sheikh Zaid Ahmed Khali, Rahmatullahi Rahmatin Wasiya, with regards to uh, the knowing who the scholars are uh, and what fiqh is, and knowing the fuqaha, the people of understanding in the religion. And he mentioned the importance of understanding this principle because the issue had become uh, upside down throughout time, especially in the time of the writing of this treatise, that the people, the average person, they were on such uh, a level of taqlid, of blind following their scholars, and especially because Sufism and the Ashari creed had become so widespread in the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that many of the people went to great extremes of going back to grave worship uh, and, and idols making tawakkul and tawassal and, and all of these other acts of worship in the heart for um, individuals, either their Sufi sheikh or their ajdad, their grandfathers, their salaf, those who preceded them. And What we have heard many times, and I myself have personally, I recall, and I've uh, spoken about this before, one of the students of knowledge, one of the major students of knowledge, the main teachers there in Dar al-Hadith and Sheher and Hadramot, uh, and I remember speaking to him about something, maybe I was in a class with him and then afterwards I was speaking to him, and he mentioned that their grandfathers used to, you know, when they would get married, before they would consummate the marriage with their wives, the, the sheikh, the local sheikh, would, the, the, the women, the virgins would be brought to them, you know, their, their wives, their new brides, and he would be, the Sufi sheikh would be the one to take her virginity, and this was a type of baraka, and this is true. Uh, he mentioned this to me from his own mouth about what their grandfathers were practicing. And likewise, I've listened recently, Sheikh Abd Razak Al-Bedr, one of our scholars in Medina, he was also mentioning a story similar to this about one of the countries that in which this practice had become widespread. So this was a practice widespread. It probably, you probably found this not just in Yemen, in certain parts of Yemen, but also in parts of Egypt and, and much of the Muslim world because a lot of uh, the world had been tainted by uh, Sufism and even, and to this extreme degree of Sufism where you have this type of, uh, you know, making the haram halal and, and just all kind of muharramat and khurafat and shirkiyat and very dangerous beliefs and practices which are detrimental to humanity but more importantly detriment, detrimental to the believer, to the Muslim. So Sheikh Zaid said, Likewise the Prophet wasallam has directed towards that with the clearest of expressions and the most beautiful of manners containing an exhortion for the one who strives hard in conveying the goodness to others. As the Prophet ﷺ said, So by Allah that Allah guides one man through you is better for you than red camels. That's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which was uh, said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, and this was during jihad. This was actually during jihad. And he, you know, he wanted to, you know, as was the son of the Prophet Sallallahu to give the risala, call the people to Tawheed before engaging in, 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 in battle. Uh, that the option was there. 
and to call the people to become brothers and to unite on the hablillah. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, لَيَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجْلٍ وَاحِدٍ خَيْرًا لَكَ مِنْ حُمْرَ النَّعْمِ That if one person is guided by your hand, this is better for you than the red camels. That right there is so important and it shows us the importance of da'wah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that whatever our level is, that you should not cease in sharing the message of Islam or the message of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to the extent of your ability. We don't call people who are jahil and who are not practicing to just go out and speak about Islam and make more, as we mentioned in the prior lesson, more mistakes than they, than they do good. That's not what we're calling to. But we're calling people to know their level and speak about those things that they have knowledge about to speak and invite people. And this is an encouragement, especially for those who have studied, those students of knowledge and others, that they should uh, you know, go forward and share whatever they have to offer to their communities. Because this is so important to, to believe this message, to give the message of true Islam and call the people to Tawheed and... The benefit for them is already illustrated because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لِيَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجِلًا وَاحِدٍ خَيْرًا لَكَ مِنْ حُمْرَ النَّعْمِ That if one person is guided by your hand, this is better for you than the red camels. So it shows us the importance of da'wah of Allah and that it will benefit your soul if you call the people with sincerity. And may Allah bless us with ikhlas, with the bat. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ said, Indeed, Allah, the angels, the people of the heavens, and the people of the earth, and even the ants in their holes, and the fish in the sea, pray for the one who teaches the people goodness. SubhanAllah, and goes on the path of knowledge. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever, whosoever directs one towards goodness, then he has a reward like that of the doer. Likewise, the noble Prophet ﷺ said, The one who has directed someone towards goodness is like the doer. So the people of fiqh, the fuqaha and the people of the sharia, uh, of sharia knowledge, are the ones who do not conceal their knowledge. Rather, they spread it and seeking the pleasure of Allah and hoping for his mercy. They seek to deliver mankind from their innovations, misguidance, straying and disobedience, and bring them to the forgiveness and a great reward, because the da'wah of the da'i extends to the day of judgment. Allahu Akbar. That, that should be an encouragement for us, Allah, to continue to go forward. The haters. So the generation in which the caller lives benefits from him and his dawah is not cut off. So it is recorded for future generations. Indeed, it is said that so-and-so said such and such and so-and-so taught us such and such and he reminded us that Allah commanded us with such and such and that Allah prohibited us from such and such. And he informed us that the noble messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam clarified with a sufficient clarification and he left the ummah upon a clear white path whose night is like its day. This is how the remembrance of the one who has knowledge, who was knowledgeable about the commands of Allah remains. So they were the scholars of the sharia and the fuqaha of Islam. Uh, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, <coughs> إِذَا مَاتَ الْمَرْعِ يَنْكَتَ الْعَمَلُهُ إِلَى مِنْ ثَلَاثٍ أَسَدَكَ جَارِيَةً الْعِلْمْ يُنْتَفَعْ بِي وَوَلَدٍ صَارِيًا يَدْعُو لَهُ The Prophet Sallallahu said in Sahih Muslim that uh, when a person dies, he leaves everything except three things, or three things follow him. He said, uh, continuous charity, beneficial knowledge, and a child that supplicates on his behalf. And another thing about knowledge, is that it requires sacrifice and it requires striving. This is why there's so much reward attached with seeking knowledge and practicing that knowledge. There's immense reward. And in order to get that fadl and that reward requires sincerity and it requires striving. Even in the things that we don't, in ways in which we can't imagine, for example, you listening to this daras. Not many people have the patience to listen to even one whole lecture, one of these 35 minute, 40 minutes lessons, however long they end up going. Most people don't have the, the patience for that. And it's only the one who is really striving to hopefully learn something new and or, you know affirm uh, something, uh, those, those Islamic principles about aqidah and tawheed that is going to make that sacrifice. Likewise, the path of Talib al-Ilm. So many people 
try to go out on that path and they never do or don't have the resilience to stay on that path. I know how many people that went to Yemen that couldn't stay six months, just a couple of months, uh, a year, whatever the case may be, that not everyone has the, the desire and the determination to make that kind of sacrifice. And as our Sheikh Imam Muqbal said, and, and it's a statement from the Salaf, that uh, that knowledge doesn't come through being relaxed, you know, being relaxed and comfortable in your body. And even a contemporary example that I hear, uh, that I recall one of the students of knowledge mentioning to me about one of our mashayikh in Medina, uh, Sheikh Suleiman Rahili, because he used to have a lot of health issues when I was in Medina. And Alhamdulillah, it seems that he's doing a much, much better. And one of the, someone who was a relative of his, I believe, and who related this to, was a teacher of one of my uh, associates, uh, had the associate mentioned to me about, he said that, you know, Sheikh Suleiman, when he was a child, while all the other kids were playing soccer, you know, or football, as you will call it, that he was in the house reading books and he was, you know, studious. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him to the level that he is at such a young age in such a powerhouse. And if you study with Sheikh Suleiman Rahimi and if you listen to him, and this is why people are now really coming to realize his, his knowledge. It's like when you listen, when you sit in one of his lectures, it, it might be about the miswak and the depth and the thick that he had, it was just as if you studied a whole book and it was just about the miswak. We didn't even get to finish the chapter. And that's how it was with studying with that, that, that great uh, sheikh who, bi'idnillah, will you know, be one of our major scholars in the future, bi'idnillah. And this is, comes from sacrifice. Likewise, all of those ulama that we love and praise that preceded us and that are still living they got there through sacrifice. They sacrificed their time because knowledge, it takes time. Sometimes, just to give you an illustration, and this is a side, even before sitting for this lesson, I was looking for something for my own research and I didn't get to write or read anything, but I spent at least a half hour just looking for books that were relevant to that topic. Sometimes it's just, Part of research is just trying to find the book, especially if you have a big library and you you know you you can't find things. You've bought books and you 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 have books on certain topics, or you know you're looking for a specific topic. Part of getting familiar with your books and familiar with knowledge, you know that that's a part of it. And sometimes just uh, researching something. Sometimes it's just you spend the time and effort to find the book. So since I found a few books, I'll. Look at them tomorrow. Tomorrow will be, that'll be tomorrow's task to actually go in them and see if they're relevant specifically to the issue that I'm looking up. So this shows you the importance of seeking knowledge and that knowledge doesn't come easily. It's not an easy thing to memorize. It's not an easy thing to sit in a lesson and a lecture. It's not an easy thing to listen to, to, to me uh, on the YouTube. But the ones who make that sacrifice, they are the ones, and they do it for the pleasure of Allah, they'll be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hopefully they will receive benefit in this life as well as the hereafter. Sheikh Zaid, he said, talking about the scholars again, they learned the truth, they acted upon it, and they taught it to others. So they are deserving of being described as the Rabbaniyun, or Rabbaniyin. And... Ibn al-Qayyum mentioned about the Rabbaniyin, he said, uh, in his book, Mifta uh, Dara Sa'ada, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala said, the Rabbani scholar is the teacher, and the term is taken from tarbiya, education. That is, he educates the people with knowledge, and he educates them just as a father would educate his child. Uh, Abu Umar al-Zahid said, I asked Tha'laba about this term, Rabbani. 
So he said, I asked Ibn al I asked Asked Ibn al Rabbani, uh, uh, Ibn al Arabi. So he said, When a man is a scholar who acts upon what he has learnt and teaches it, is said about him, This one is Rabbani. So if any characteristic from that is missed, then it cannot be said about him that he is a Rabbani. Uh, another definition that, that the Salaf used to mention about a Rabbani the Rabbani is the one who teaches people the small issues before teaching them the major issues. So know that it's a dangerous thing. If someone is busying you with the intricate details of Jarwa Ta'deel and they haven't taught you anything about the basics of Islam and you're a new Muslim, that this is not the concept of Rabbani. The Rabbani is teaching you step by step. And there's so many statements of the Salaf. There's one particular statement which is, and this is just the rough paraphrase, that the one who takes all the knowledge at once is the one who keeps no knowledge basically is what it, what it means in essence meaning that knowledge you know as a natural thing if you were to memorize all of these you the only way you could keep this knowledge is by continually revising and keeping that in your memory which would be very difficult for you to do so the point is is it comes in stages and it's step by step and it's uh, as the Yemeni say the la da la you know, it's step by step. Uh, then, Sheikh Muhammad ibn al Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala said, and it was increased in clarity by the sunnah with abundant speech that is clear and elusive enough for even the most ignorant common person. So Sheikh Zaid mentioned about this. He said, this is because the ayat of the Quran are clear and shining brilliantly. Whosoever listens and gives ear to them whilst he is from amongst while he is from amongst the people of reasoning, will understand whatever they are instructing from the objective and desired goal. And the meanings will not be missed, except by one who turns away from the mighty book of Allah and from the authentic and purified sunnah due to whatever has overtaken him from his desires or whatever has preoccupied him from his uh, worldly life. Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahhab Rahim, Rahim Allah Ta'ala said, Then the strangest of things occurred. And knowledge and fit came to be considered innovations and misguidance in, in the rest of the statements that he said. Uh, Sheikh Zaid mentioned about this. This is according to whom? And it is in the dictionary of whom? And it is in the hearts of whom? Indeed, it is in the hearts of the people of innovation, whether it be innovations that amount to disbelief or innovations that amount to disobedience and misguidance. And the difference between the two is that innovations that amount to disbelief take one outside the realm of Islam, and even if the doer is from the group of the Muslims before that. Indeed, the people of innovation make desperate efforts to defend their innovations, and they are bent upon attracting the people to them so that the people may be upon that which they are upon. From amongst them are the worshiper of the graves and those who go to extremes with regards to the inhabitants of the tombs in every time and in every place. And, O oh Allah, how much harm have they inflicted upon the people? Indeed, the objectionable innovation of the graves has emerged, and its domain has become expansive throughout the eastern and western parts of the world after the excellent generations during the days of the state, which was called the Fatimi nation state of the uh, Ubaidiyin. Uh, the people lived within that state for no less than a hundred years, so the innovations became widespread. The tombs were sanctified, built up and clothed with garments and outstanding fabrics. They were scented and people circled around them. The reason for this was the ignorance of the people who claimed knowledge. Whilst they were ignorant about the command of Allah and the command of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so they embellished for the people that these ones were close friends of Allah. That's why they say the only of Allah that they do not fear nor do they grieve. So they would say this about the people of bid'ah and desires. They actually made these people who, some of these people were from the and uh, you know, the heretics and so forth, and people thought that, uh, claimed that these were the most righteous of people. Some of them were some of the most wasakh and dirty and filthy of the people. Uh, dirty and filthy as in on their bodies, you know, not bathing because they thought that this was uh, a type of uh, of, of coming closer to Allah and a type of asceticism. 
you know, as as we mentioned prior to this, you know, those, you know, the 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 bid'ah that the people had so much belief in these uh, these deviant so-called scholars that they either worshipped them or they gave them everything of their dunya or they sought blessings from them, and they even sought blessings from them from their own virgin spouses by giving them to them and then now that now she's blessed after he's had his way with her wallahu mustaan so then the shaykh mentioned so they embellish for the people that those ones were close friends of allah that they do not fear nor do they grieve and they say to the people these ones are the close friends of Allah. They have whatever they wish from Allah. And you are a nation of disobedient sinners. But you are people who have needs. So come and draw closer to them. Seek salvation through them. And seek intercession with their rank. And seek a means of approach to Allah through their persons. So they will hear you and raise your needs to Allah. With regards to bringing about goodness and removal of harm. So you see how shirk, like a snowball... It has a snowball effect. It grows and it grows and it grows. The people began with some a smaller de form of deviance in uh, declaring that their scholars or their dead were just righteous people who they should pay homage to, who should they, they should respect and adorn their graves, to then people making tawaf and going, going around their graves, to people then seeking their needs and seeking help and support and assistance from the graves and the dead and from their scholars. And this shows you how dangerous shirk is and how it how it creeps into the ummah of Muhammad salawatu rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi. And then he said that these people, they would say, so they will hear you and raise your needs to Allah with regards to bringing about goodness and removal of harm. So the people began to seek intercession from these, uh, from the dead. And we say without hesitation that this was an action of the disbelieving Arabs and whoever followed their way from amongst the creation in the time of the Prophet wasallam. they were those whom Allah informed us about in his statement about the advice that they gave to each other. Continue and be patient over your gods. Indeed, this is a thing intended. We have not heard of this in the latest religion. This is not but a fabrication. Indeed, the Ummah lived and refuge is sought with Allah for a long period of time and the majority of them were in this condition which Allah the great and exalted hates and the earth was not devoid of the people of the Sharia knowledge and fiqh of the religion so those of them who were found at the time endured a gr good trial even though their numbers were few they clarified to the people that this was major shirk and that there was no difference between this and the shirk which the disbelievers in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do. There is no difference between the polytheists in these instances, the worshippers of tombs, and those who seek aid from them, and between the polytheists whom the Prophet Alayhi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fought. There is no difference between these ones and those ones. So they all used to say, We only worship them that they may bring us nearer to Allah in position. Surah Al-Zumar in verse uh, 3. So all of them would say, we believe in Allah. He is the creator, the sustainer, the one who grants life, and the one who grants death. However, they were in agreement with regards to directing the majority, majority of their worship to the inhabitants of tombs from the people of the graves. And they were in agreement with regards to directing the majority of their worship to those whom they called awliya, even if they were still living. So they would draw close to them and they believed that they would bring about the benefits and remove the harms in terms of that which none can grant besides Allah, the one, the subduer. So it shows you how the people went astray with shirk. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Let tatibi'oonu sunan in kana qablakum. The Prophet ﷺ said, You would follow the way of the people who came before you, uh, hand span by hand span, arm span by arm span, until they went into the hole of a lizard, you would follow them. And they said, uh, the, those Sahabi, they said, uh, the, who are they, Rasulullah, the Jews and the Christians? And the Prophet said, for men, who else? 
Who else? Letting us know that we would follow them in shirk and we would follow them in their ways and everything. The Prophet ﷺ said, Men huwa minhum. Whoever resembles a people, he is from them. So it's very dangerous, ahabat fillah, to beware. And, to, and it shows us the importance of knowing who the ulama are and knowing what ilm is and knowing what fiqh is and knowing that ilm is qalallah wa qal rasul and ilm and the true knowledge is knowing tawheed and how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly. Uh, in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and that bid'ah will only lead you astray into the fire. And so this is very important knowledge for us to understand and for us to actualize and practice. The Shaykh then said, therefore, the innovations are a disease and the most evil of them is the innovation that takes its doer out of the realm of Islam. And none of these innovations can be neglected. So the innovations that are below that level are also an impending evil upon their people and upon the societies in which they are spread and become prevalent. Indeed, the Prophet wasallam warned in his lifetime that innovations would appear. And that was from amongst his Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam miracles, meaning that he prophesied those things. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Beware of newly invented affairs, since every newly invented affair is an innovation. And every innovation is misguidance, and every misguidance is in the fire. This does not exclude any innovation, whether it is related to statements or actions, meaning relation innovations in the deen. And it does not exclude any innovation, neither small nor large due to whatever is contained within the innovations from evil. That is because the innovations are an accusation that the religion of Allah contains a shortcoming and that within them is association with Allah in regards to legislation. And this is a great sin that no one is free from except for the one who accepts the book of his Lord and the authentic sunnah of his Prophet wasallam, and asks about the minhaj of the Salaf al-Saleh and learns at the hands of their followers. So Allah the Blessed and Exalted has written success for him since he has fulfilled his need by relying to wakil upon Allah and taking to the perm uh, permissible Sharia causes. So if the causes, meaning the sabab, the, the reasons, are abandoned and reliance upon Allah, then the goals will be missed. The objectives will die out and evil, oppressive, and harmful results which do not benefit will come about. So here the Shaykh is talking about the importance of tawakkul, which the scholars mention is i'timad ala Allah wa fi'la asbab, that it is relying strictly upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or putting your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while doing actions to actualize that. So for example, the one who wants rizq, he, he not only prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and puts his heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he actually goes out and tries to get a job. He tries to hustle. He tries to do whatever it takes to bring in money and to bring income. And likewise in other worldly affairs. And that's what uh, the true sahih tawakal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Then the Shaykh said, therefore the innovations can occur in the societies with regards to Aqidah as occurred from the evil belief of the Jahamiya, the Mu'tazila, the Asha'ira, and the Sufiya. Uh, and all of these were misguided innovations. Some of them took the doer outside of Islam, and some of them brought the greatest danger upon their doer, even though he did not leave the realm of Islam. Uh, likewise, there have come innovations in the acts of worship. So he's talking about the various types of innovations. Uh, he said there are innovations in that what which is connected to the prayer, its remembrances and its positions, meaning afkar and bidah in the in salat and other acts of ibadah, and that all of this are very uh, very serious and very danger. And as the Prophet sallallahu said, kulu bidatin dalala, kulu bidatin dalala. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi said all innovation is misguided. Is misguidance, and so it's very important habitifillah for us to understand this, these principles, to actualize these principles, propagate these principles, memorize these principles, uh, and share these principles with others. Because this is, these are principles derived from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And how else do the people become misguided? They become misguided through through ignorance and by following misguided ones, people who misguide them, either people who are on pure misguidance and lie and deceive and they know it, or people who don't know that there are misguidance, but they, they still teach and propagate misguidance. 
And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil and protect us from kufr, shirk, and nifaq and all of those things which displease him subhanahu wa ta'ala wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.